Hey guys, I'm going to introduce today's guest, Kara Roman. Um, Kara has three girls and her and her husband have really faced some serious life challenges and I admire their steadfast strength through those challenges. I think everyone's going to enjoy her fun and quirky and authentic personality and Kara has some great tips on trying to stay healthy on the go or when you're struggling to provide for your kids. I also appreciate that she gives herself a ton of forgiveness and grace when it comes to just getting through the day and feeding her kids what she knows they will eat. I'm just really excited for everyone to hear this interview with Kara because not knowing her story prior to listening, I was just in awe of the twists and turns that her family's journey has taken, the personal experiences that she has with food, and how she has kind of used all of those things to get to a better place with food and how that's translating into the way that she feeds her family. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Kara and I can't wait for everybody to hear from her. Kara, can you give me a little bit of a synopsis or a summary of, you know, what's been going on in your life as far as feeding your family over the last few years? I have some intel, but I would love for you to tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, your family and your daily life when it comes to feeding your family. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Um, so, oh my goodness, food has been such a journey for me over my entire lifetime, actually. And it, that, of course, directly correlates to how I want to introduce food to my family. Um, so I've been married for about, oh goodness, like nine years. We currently have two biological kids and one foster daughter, ages five, three and a half, and three and a half. The three and a half year olds are actually two days apart. Um, Wow. I know, right? <laughs> that was a coincidence. Um, so it's, it's crazy. It's crazy busy. <laughs> yeah, I would say just a little. Why don't you tell us about how you, how you found yourself in foster care a little bit and just everything to do with, um, with John in some sort of synopsis way that you can explain to our listeners so they understand okay. where you're coming from. Okay. Basically, we ended up in foster care because I decided to, after my first baby was born, I decided I need to run away from teaching as fast as I could <laughs> because <laughs> I was teaching in an inner city district and I, was, I just was, didn't see myself putting my child in daycare five days a week. And that's great for some people. But for me, I knew personally, I just wouldn't be able to do it. My anxiety is way too high. <laughs> so I started doing everything under the sun. I worked at a gym daycare. I did in-home daycare for just random kids I found on Craigslist <laughs> that end up living like around the corner. Um, I worked at a conference center. I was like in the kitchen as a hostess. Like I, and I have zero hostessing skills or restaurant skills whatsoever. Like I pretty much have been doing like everything I absolutely could to kind of make ends meet. And my husband's a high school teacher. So we are, I had no business quitting my job. <laughs> so I was like, yep. Yeah. I'm just not going back. I'm not doing it. Um, but we were making it work and we're doing whatever it takes to make it work. Um, we did, after I had my second daughter, I had found Arbonne and that was something I wanted nothing to do with. I thought it was just too expensive. And I, but my friend kept asking me to have a party and have a party. And I was like, all right, I will have a party. And there's a 30 day clean eating challenge with Arbonne. And that absolutely changed my life. I, long history, back when they said we have a long history of food problems, I have struggled with an eating disorder my entire life. Like, I was bulimic in high school. I absolutely struggled. Um, I just tried every counting containers, points, whatever you wanted to count, whatever diet there was. I've been to the Weight Watchers meetings. I've been to, I've done it all over my lifetime, but this was wow. the first program that actually kind of focuses on foods that are addictive, allergenic, um, it takes out the foods that really tend to give people trouble. It's an elimination type idea and to kind of reset your body and take out toxins. And what I found is I had a really big food, addi uh, sugar addiction, which I had zero idea I had. I just thought I had bad willpower. So I'd look at the skinny girl next to me and be like, oh, she just has really good willpower. And I, I do not. So we kind of did the 30 day challenge and fell in love with it. We both lost weight. And then just the, just the difference alone in my anxiety and my self-control with food, it was like night and day. And I find myself too, if I eat 
we, I kind of do the 80, 20 rule when I stray too far, my addiction starts to kick back in. I feel it to sugar. I'm like a heroin addict with sugar. Um, I have no control when I'm like in it. And I've learned so much about how your brain gets so addicted to sugar and lights up so many more areas than cocaine does in your brain than sugar, which, you know, like you were like, I look at how you feed your kids and I'm like always in awe of it. Um, well, thank you. I, um, I just want to like stop you right there and say that's a really big deal for you to, to, to first of all, recognize this battle, this unhealthy relationship you've had with food mm-hmm. to say, I'm not going to put this on my children. I need to figure out what's going on and to take that step to say, oh, wow, this is what was happening to me. And now you know, and now you can recognize when you start to swing and the pendulum goes the wrong way. You're like, oh no, I'm going back down there. So kudos to you. Thanks for the props, but it's been a long journey for me too in a different way. But I, I love that you can share that. And I appreciate you sharing that because that I'm sure has always been a sensitive topic. And now that you're grown, you're, you can kind of reflect on it. Yeah. So I'm psyched about that. Um, it sounds like that worked out really well for you. How um, you, you're welcome to go on about, you know, the, the journey that you were having, but I want, I would love for you to focus in on um, what happened next after that. Yes, exactly. It's exactly what I was thinking of. And that's because, and that's where I kind of found like a career, like a little bit while at home, not a little bit, a lot while at home. <laughs> um, and it really has affected how I've started feeding my kids. Um, just me really trying to take out as much sugar as possible. Like, I mean, we can't take it like all out, but right. just trying as hard as I could and making sh- like trying just the little steps that I could possibly do each night when I do the dinner meals and everything. So one thing that we like to talk about is like, what was your superpower, right? Mm-hmm. Like what is your superpower when it comes to feeding your family? What things do you feel like you do really well for them at this stage? And this comes for your own children. And I, you know, I'd love for you to touch on your foster daughter and, Mm. um, you know, how there might be new challenges there. I'd love to get into that. So go ahead and and tell me what you think about that. Yeah. So we ended up getting into fostering and that was something I'd always wanted to do. Um, we did that with one child for a while and there's definitely major challenges with that because kids come into the home and usually the food that they choose are completely different than what our kids are now used to eating. Um, what I, what my superpower, I feel like and my secret, what I've been doing with my kids is to always make sure there's a food on the plate that's healthy, that they like. Mm-hmm. So I have a couple, my couple dogs that really like red peppers. So there's right. always some sliced red peppers on that plate. Like it's good, solid nutrients. So if they eat nothing else, they will eat that, those peppers. That's awesome. So you're always thinking in the back of your head, at least one thing on your plate is brand new. And it's always kind of a gradual process. And I've, and I was a super picky eater too. I have so many textural issues <laughs> with food. So I understand it. My, my kids are the same way. Um, That's so we, interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's, I really understand the gradual need, like taking that bite of a food they're not used to. Like, I feel like someone would, would like, could be threatening me with a knife. <laughs> and I wouldn't want to spill that food. <laughs> like, I, I'm like, I get it. Like, I still get it, but I need to get you to eat all these different foods because they did get, they have had phases of their, their life where they've gotten way pickier than I've wanted them to. Mm-hmm. So I know you mentioned John and what he went through. And basically last January, he was diagnosed with the, as you know, but <laughs> tell me when he was diagnosed with a rare um, form of lymphoma, a great called gray zone lymphoma. It's a mixture between Hodgkin's and not Hodgkin's. So he spent a lot of time in the hospital, like six days a week in the hospital um, for a chemo treatment. And then he'd be home, but he'd really be up in bed for two weeks and then back to the hospital for six days. So I kind of did what was easiest for my kids at that time, which would just be what would they'd like. So I think I, I'd buy like the antibiotic free, like dinosaur nuggets and I know it's not the best, but I'm like, it's not the worst and I have to just be okay with it. But I'd still put those red peppers on the plate or like green beans, like with them or with what anything else. But I, there was a lot of Annie's mac and cheese and I'd try to make sure it wouldn't be the orange ones with the dye. Be like, At least it's the real color of cheese. Um, so during that time period, they got a lot pickier. So we're working now at trying to 
expand it now that he's back um, to being in good health. Like at the dinner table, we're trying to push them to try bites of the new food each night. Like I keep telling them, you got to keep trying it. Just keep trying. I don't like it. You got to keep trying it. Um, my current foster daughter now, it's really interesting. Her um, mom was a real foodie because we actually fostered her mom too. They came in as a teen mom and child duo in August. Um, she was a real foodie and her goal in life is to open a restaurant. Um, so her daughter is too. And it's strange that she actually eats absolutely everything. Like I put some um, stuffed oysters down on the uh, table for myself and John and she just started eating them. She was like, thanks. Great. I was just like, I didn't make one for you, <laughs> but I was like, go ahead. I, mean, I love that story. That's awesome. Yeah. So I've, she's so, like, really easy to feed healthy. She's easier than like myself to feed healthy sometimes. <laughs> I love it. Um, so, so much content just came at me and I know our no, listeners sorry. are thinking, she just skated past this whole thing, but it's <laughs> fine. I don't want you to have to dive any further into it than you want to or what have you, but um. Yes. So your husband was very sick. He was, you know, you were dealing with feeding him and, um, and feeding your children and trying to keep yourself intact mm -hmm. during a very stressful time. And it, what I'm hearing from you is that, you know, sort of having this good enough mentality and stamina to say, you're going to at least do this. I mean, the fact that you could even put food on the table for your kids is, is a triumph in my opinion. So congratulations on that. I know. <laughs> I know when I saw you week by week, I thought, God, she's, she's a, she's really doing this. She's like amazing. And, um, not that I just need to sit here and say you're amazing because you are, but I understand also that you felt like you had no choice and this was your life and you had to step it up and that's amazing. And I think the good enough approach, especially given that situation is, is totally commendable and it totally makes sense. And, um, I would say that, yeah, your superpower was just making sure they got the minimum they absolutely needed. It. And now the fact that you're taking a step back and you're able to reroute yourself and say, okay, John's in good health. Let's get back to this, like raising kids thing. <laughs> yeah. <know? laughs> and yeah. So, so that is fabulous. I would love for you to flip the script and maybe share something that you feel like is maybe your kryptonite like something that you're like, I just can't help myself with this, or even when it comes to yourself or your kids in, and, and however you might define that. That's something we ask everybody. Gosh, my kryptonite. <laughs> oh, I have to think about this. Pro uh, probably the, I have too much empathy for them being scared to try new foods. Cause as a kid, I would never try new foods. My brother and I were the pickiest eaters in the entire world. My brother, he would eat plain pasta on Thanksgiving and that was it. And my mom would cook the white pasta for him with butter. Um, so that he, no, even red sauce. Like, so I, that's definitely my kryptonite is that like, I feel too much. I'm like, for them, I'm like, instead of just saying, nope, this is dinner. Yeah. And, or that's it. And I wish I had been more like that from the beginning. Um, but I also, because of my past food struggles, I never want to make food too much of a fight because mm. food has always been my biggest battle in life. Um, so I feel like me obsessing about food and my weight over the years like took mm -hmm. away a lot of my life. And now I have, like God's given me three girls in this house that I have, I don't want to make it a fight for them. Mm. So I tr really try not to make it a fight. And that's kind of why I do the little steps, but I just need to make sure I don't put my problems on them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something I've already seen several times in some of our interviews is people saying, when I was a kid, I would have turned my nose up, you know, to that food. So I can't believe I, my kids even eat a kale smoothie or whatever it is, you know? Um, so I think it's commendable to recognize like, if I wouldn't eat this as a kid and my kid is eating something even better, great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like good enough. There's something to be said about good enough. And I agree with you as raising three kids for me, you know, mm -hmm. I say, I think of the same things. Like how is their relationship with food going to work out? Like, what does this look like? What, what, how are we influencing that? Um, yeah. 
So yeah, and it's funny because one of my questions was going to be, how does the way you were brought up affect your food life now? I mean, do you feel that you still are, I mean, we've talked a little bit about when you went through the cleansing, how you feel like you've been a sugar addict. Do you feel like you face a lot of the, the um, same challenges that you did as a child? Do you feel like you've evolved in some way? Or um, what would you say first comes to mind when I ask that? I definitely, it's been such a journey. I definitely feel like I've evolved. I've come a very long way. It was many years of therapy and looking at that relationship and food for me will be a sign that like there's a problem going on with where my mental state is. So when I'm overeating, I sometimes notice that before I notice what I'm actually battling with, like what I'm really struggling with. Um, Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. I love that you just said that because... (laughs) I too have, not necessarily with food, but I too relate to the feeling of, I will get so upset over something so small that I'll be like, why am I so upset about this? And you're like, oh, I'm so overwhelmed by X, Y, and Z that it has nothing to do with this and mm-hmm. how we can get so diverted with our brains. Like, yeah. and so it's amazing that you even recognize that because some of us are not there yet. So that alone is going to help you, I think, quite a bit mm-hmm. um, with raising children and, and not having them, you know. So anyway, um, that's really interesting. I didn't know your, your, your struggle with this either. So it's even more interesting oh. to have you talk about um, how food has been such an influence on your life. Is there something um, that you can recognize from being young or is there something that you think about well this is what I want to avoid with my kids because I think that might have contributed to my own issues um, that you can parallel to raising your children is there something that set you off or is it just feel like it just kind of transpired oh yeah that's a big question <laughs> that's like definitely and feel free to keep it as, you know, you don't yeah, have to get no, super I'm deep. No, I'm just trying but... to think of the right way to say it. Because um, I spent years in therapy on this. And I'm such an open book with this. Like, I'm surprised. I, I appreciate that. You. <laughs> like, I'm just such an open book. I'm like, this is my journey, blah, blah, blah. I just, I talk all the time. I talk to anything. Uh, anybody. <laughs> I talk to walls. It doesn't matter. Uh, myself, the kids, the pets. Um, I love it. Definitely, there were a lot of things how I was raised that were said to me that was, I never felt good enough or I felt intrinsically wrong. Like I was never good enough or something was wrong with me. And it's a definitely a self-confidence issue. And I've spent a lot of years faking it until I make it and trying to quiet that voice in my head that's there all the time. Um, Mm. And I remember, you know, you know, very person like, important person in my life saying to me like oh you better lay off the cookies like your belly is getting a little big like at like a very crucial stage like I want to say it was like 11 or 12 and then yeah it was never if I felt something like felt bad my my family was fitness like freaks so they'd be like well why don't you go for a run instead of you're beautiful or you look great or like we'll go for a run (laughs) like yeah like fix yourself right yeah so there was lots of moments like that with my that I dealt with with my upbringing um yeah there wasn't a lot of health and nutrition like knowledge going on there was desserts every night after dinner like Mm -hmm. there was mugs of ice cream every night or always homemade cookies always cakes and um I never had a fast metabolism I like where other members in my family did. So I'm like, as I'm talking to you, I'm having the flashbacks of like, we ate junk, but my body didn't metabolize it well. Mm. And I went to, like, so as I got older, it didn't sit well on me. It didn't feel well on me. My anxiety was always through the roof. Um, I appreciate you sharing such a sensitive thing um, with us on this podcast. I really do. I think that's a really hard thing to do, but I know that you just said you're an open book, but also, um, 
revisiting it is not easy. And no, it's actually really fine. Is it? It's not, it's not hard. It's part of my journey. Like every single thing I've been through. And I know I kind of just blew through my like history so, like, and everything and for people like listening, I'm like all over the place, but it's so just brought me to who I am today. And like back to that question about how I want to raise my kids is I'm just trying to not let them have that, sh- keep them from that sugar addiction mm-hmm. that I had number one. And two, I just, my biggest fear is that they won't just feel good about themselves. And I just want them to just feel great about themselves and feel free to be who they are, whoever yes. they are, instead of, I don't want them to have that. I'm do, always doing something wrong feeling Yeah, um, and trying to not make food an issue. That's why I just always try to have food they like, gear them towards the right things, introduce lots of different things, which again is my downfall because I get into the same routines over and over and over again. Um, because again, like I don't, I've gotten better now. I guess it's been, it's all comparison really. Like if, if I say I don't eat a lot of foods versus I do, it depends on who I'm talking to, but like you still couldn't pay me to eat broccoli. Like, (laughs) like, I, yeah. I it, so I don't make it for my family. My husband loves it, but I'm not like, well, let me buy this broccoli. So now my, my kids, most of them don't eat broccoli. Well, most of them don't eat broccoli. I have one kid who keeps trying when we're out. But I'm like, if I actually cook that every week, they would start eating it. <laughs> right. But I don't buy it. <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm hearing so many messages here, but I love the idea of avoiding like the negative self-talk. Like, um, when you grew up the way you did and, and, you know, I'm sure that this was a, by no necessary, any fault of any one person, but a collective environment you were happened to be in, um, how much negative self-talk you were probably having internally. And, and, that, and that's something, even as a mom, that we all kind of face, if we have the food in our house and we're like, I want to eat it. Don't eat it. Why are you going to eat it? You're having this sort of weird <laughs> argument with yourself. Um, that, you know, children could have too, if they have those kind of messages coming at them where food becomes a comfort or a stress or whatever. So, you know, I'm hearing that bringing up kids who are confident and understand what food's purpose is and enjoy food when they want to is basically a great theme, but without purposely doing that, you know, we're not, you know, we're not creating these good habits um, or, 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 or allowing them to create themselves. Yeah, I've been really trying to focus too on teaching what food is healthy, what food is not healthy, and this food makes your body feel good, and this makes your body feel bad, or this Mm -hmm. might make your body feel sick. Um, I try to say that a lot, or I'll say that has a lot of sugar, and sugar makes our bodies feel sick, so we try to eat the healthier option, Um, trying to teach them just just make that matter of fact. So, yeah, absolutely. I think talking a lot about what food is for and with your body. I think that's a fabulous way to approach it. Um, What you were just talking about with the broccoli, it had me thinking, okay, there's an example, but I'm curious what might be one thing in the most recent months that you're doing to bring your, your, that you're kind of setting as a goal to bring your health, uh, health of your family up a little bit. What's your latest sort of thing or is there something you're you're thinking about trying with them I'm just curious well it's definitely with my two biological daughters are trying to get the food variations going trying different meal plans um we're actually my husband and I are trying to eat as clean as possible together as he's in recovery right now um he gained a lot of weight after his treatments and that he really struggles with mentally. Um, and a lot of the chemo really affected the way he processed carbs too. Um, interesting. Yeah. Like it's pretty amazing. Um, what it, how, how good it was that it saved his life, but how bad it was for his body and the, the effects that came from it. Um, yeah. So, I- our goal is to eat as, we're trying to eat as clean as possible right now, like no processed foods, trying to eat as many vegetables as possible. I feel like that's the name of the game right now. Get the kids to eat as much, many vegetables and legumes as possible. Um, clean meats, 
seafood. We're trying to get them to eat more of it and us to just stick to those very clean foods. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I can appreciate your approach there. I mean, at the end of the day, it comes down to just doing the best you can mm -hmm. yes. every, every single day. We're all trying to just get through the day and to be able to get through the day and still feed your kids healthy is an accomplishment. Yes. Oh, but yeah. I mean, tonight was one had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. One had a jelly sandwich. The other one had puffs and almond. The, the cereal, I just found them there. Like they're called like puffs. They were at Whole Foods. They had the lowest sugar I could find. I don't know. And she had those in milk and yeah, I kind of quit today. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, here you go. I'm done. Yeah. And you know what? That's okay. It's yes. totally okay. We all need, we all need days like that where yep. we're like, you're eating. Yeah. Like I was joking with her mom the other day, you're eating a piece of salami and the apple you just found in the toy box. I don't know. I, <laughs> you'll be fine for break till breakfast. <laughs> yep. <laughs> totally fine. Yeah. My husband I would, and I threw some salads together. I heated some turkey meat in a bowl. And hey, that's not bad. No, no, I don't think so. I've discovered a cashew cheese that I'm like in love with. Oh, yum. Did that you I mix with it? That mm -hmm. sounds yum. Yeah. Did you find that during his treatments or during that whole process that you kind of pivoted your, your energy to either him or something just to get by and figure, and then you kind of rerouted? I'm curious how you. Yeah. Well, I came completely last. <laughs> I, um, of course, most Mom. of the mornings, I pretty much just made myself a protein shake and I probably then didn't eat again till like three, four o'clock. Like I'd, I'd really try not to eat the hospital foods and the other junky foods around. Um, it's very hard though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, definitely drank a lot more wine than I, a person ever should have, but my friends all know me. So they all would just show up with two bottles of wine. So I think at one point I had a stack of like 20 bottles like, that just entered my house within one week. Right. Um, like, I don't know what to say, but I brought one. Yes. <laughs> I was like, they're my friends. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I was, I was in really good shape right before he got diagnosed and he was on a path, which we were actually just talking about tonight, how him being in as good a shape as he was really helped him during his treatments opposed to with like where he was six months before that. So that was such a blessing. But yeah, during the treatments, it was all about trying to feed him as healthy as possible, or so I tried, um, until his oncologist said, you just need to eat whatever you want to eat while you can. And he took that as the green light of let's eat everything. <laughs> and I think with a lot of cancer patients in the past, the nausea drugs weren't as good as they were today. So people would get really, really nauseous and they wouldn't be able to eat. He actually had very little days of nausea. Um, they would hook up a nausea bag before they would administer the chemo and he would get bags and bags of nausea meds while the chemo dripped in them for six days. So he didn't really get that nauseous during the whole hmm. ordeal. So he, and then he was mostly in bed for six months when he would just eat um, right. anything. <laughs> and so this, that was just very interesting. I'm now in like a tirade about <laughs> wishing doctors would combine efforts with other amazing people like you and nutritionists and people that study nutrition. Sure. I understand. That. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that could, and we could get into that, but I understand yeah. what you're saying. It's, but in hindsight, it's always 2020 and you guys were really just trying to yes. forge through, you know, and, yes. <laughs> and, um, and now it sounds like you're both working on just one step closer to better. And that's all that really matters. Yes. We're working on it. And the kids, they definitely got super picky because it was a lot of mac and cheese and chicken nuggets. <laughs> so because. that being said, would you say you maybe like your favorite, like sort of packaged foods that we'll do in a pinch or basically the healthier chicken nuggets and the healthier mac and cheese? Yeah. That's <laughs> my good enough. Like Good enough. My kids, they do love brown rice and quinoa, but there's something easy about 
<laughs> just throwing in that box. I don't know why. It's probably has something to do with my upbringing if we wanted to study it. <laughs> yeah, no, who knows why? I mean, how about just because life is busy and yes. I mean, I would be curious um, how you prepare for the week, you know, if you're preparing for the week, how you kind of mentally prepare to feed your family nowadays um, each week. Oh my gosh, I'm all over the place right now. Probably the way I've been talking, I'm just completely over the, all over the place in life. Um, I think yeah. people will relate to that, Kara, <laughs> so, so don't worry about it. I mean, I had my phases where I meal prepped on Sunday night and everything, but you know what, now, right now I have the luxury, I can go to the grocery store on Mondays. So Mondays, Sunday, Monday's like eat whatever's left over in the fridge. I will go on Monday when the grocery store isn't packed. Like I'm not seven foot in that store on Saturday or Sunday. Right. Um, so You're yeah, I haven't been preparing for the week. I did meet up with a bunch of girlfriends. We did a freezer crock pot night day, which I highly recommend. I love one that. friend printed out all the recipes and we went, we did all the, we all did our own grocery shopping and just showed up and we made like seven freezer meals of like for crock pots, which was awesome. Um, Kara, I think you just gave me my favorite moment of this podcast. I love that idea. It wasn't my idea, but <laughs> it was a friend. So yeah, it was really nice. Um, and then they did different meals. I did, I tried to clean it up a little bit and make sure my meals didn't include anything that had sugar in it. Um, so I did my own separate meals where she actually had it nice on a PowerPoint of the different recipes and the steps and they all did the steps together. And I kind of in the corner did my own little one because <laughs> I was trying to like make sure the sugar was out for me at that moment. <laughs> sure. I understand you were on a, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but it worked beautifully. So I that, love that. Yeah. I love that idea. So for our listeners, a crock pot party is where it's at. If you don't feel like prepping. Oh yeah. No, we're planning to do another one. We had mimosas too. We did a Sunday morning. It was really fun. And we sent music on and talked and, caught up and it was good but other than that I've had those stored in the freezer so I've been doing like one of those a week trying to space them out and other than that I've been kind of just making stuff up like each night like I was kind of just going with what I feel like doing if I feel like cooking I do I really I'll grab random stuff right now I'm all over the place <laughs> I appreciate that because sometimes, you know, myself or other people on this will be like, I was so organized and people are going to be like rolling their eyes. Like, seriously, what, you know, no, no, not me. <laughs> but real life and people with differing, you know, focus levels have to be able to appreciate and understand, okay, what would you do in a pinch or what's your best way of getting one step healthier? So I love, I love that you're like, I, I got you the good enough meal and here's some red peppers and everybody. <laughs> And everybody's good and clean and and there's something to be said for you know balancing stress with healthy eating because if you're stressing out about healthy eating, how healthy is that? Well, that's exactly where I always talk about our 30 days, like that's why I kind of love it because it's not like a scheduled anything. It just you take out certain foods and focus on the clean food. So it's not as much like of the food noise in my head. Do I eat this? Do I not? Do I have, like, you just eat clean. And it's, that's where I actually learned a lot of my recipes. Like we have a whole bunch. We put people on Facebook groups and stuff too, to coach people through it. Cause I look back to where I was before I did it. And I didn't know a lot of those recipes. And now I kind of make them up during the week because I've done them. And I followed the group a few times and then I got them from the, like the page and everything. And now I can just bust out my favorite recipes real quick. I just kind of always stock the ingredients that those recipes need. And like, I always keep a couple of packages of the ground turkey in the freezer for ground turkey, like fajita, like, or fajita night or whatever night, chicken. Right. Right. So basically it makes sense to me that you're kind of, once you do all your homework and you're studying and you kind of heavy load with learning these recipes that are cleaner, because sometimes it's just overwhelming mm -hmm. to be able, if you can eat anything, it's almost harder than when you feel like you, you have to restrict because then you'll eat anything and you're not preparing for the latest. But if you're like, these are the only things I can eat, how can I get creative? Mm -hmm. um, and let me get these cool recipes. And then you sort of just replay the greatest hits every week. 
you know, yeah. like, <laughs> that you know your kids might eat and you'll eat and and that's great so do you tend to cook separately for you and john than the kids well that's the problem is i w- i was cooking separately a lot when we had um we had different we had a 14 month old foster daughter and it was just too hard to eat sit down and eat because at the time we had a 14 month old a 20 month old and a four-year-old so there was just no sitting down and eating at that time so i was cooking separately and i realized that was such a downfall to my kids because then they weren't being exposed to our foods and the other problem is john and i love everything spicy like we love spicy everything so that's also a problem to try with little kids like you can't give them super spicy things so i would make something separate where i had been making their dinner before and we fell in i did that fell into that again when john was sick and when we took in our two new foster daughters in august just because it was so much easier to just cook them something i know they're gonna like and then they go to bed at seven and john and i'm like okay Hi, by the way, let's, <laughs> what's your name? How was your day? Um, he works really late too. He wor- He's out the door by quarter to seven and he walks in the door at 6.30 or 6.15 and the kids go to bed at seven. So sometimes it's, it's so much easier to just feed the kids something quick and easy, put them in their pajamas and then he walks in and we can put them to bed and have our own dinner. So but I just feel like it's so, such a downfall for the kids. And now that we've been, doing family dinners again. They're trying more because they see what's on our plate. I try to cook it a little less spicy now, or I make a version for them that's not as spicy. Like uh, before I add my spices to things um, on the stove, like I'll take a little bit out for them. Like I'll do dishes that have brown rice, quinoa pasta, or I, um, or brown rice. And I just mix all my spicier stuff in after and I take out a section for them. Yeah. So that's kind of like, or my stuff will be all mixed together and I'll separate it a little bit for them or yeah. they hate red sauce. So I'll try to give them the turkey meatballs. I'll rinse them off and take the red sauce off of them. Um, they like detest red sauce. They actually don't even eat pizza unless we make it with white sauce or I order it with white sauce. And so. that, yeah. And that's I'm totally understandable. I hated tomato sauce as a kid. I hated it. You couldn't pay me to eat it. But, um, and plus I know you've got your sensitive side where you're like, I know, texture. I I totally get it. (laughs) But I think what's really cool about your story is that you, there's this ebb and flow that's very natural considering the stressors and the changes. Because most of us have basically had a child, raised them, had another child, raised the family. You know, you've had other, other children in your home you've had major illness in your home i just think the fact that you can say okay now it's time we can get back to eating together whenever we can like just the fact that you can sit and recognize the ebb and flow and when it's best to introduce this again knowing what's best for your kids that's what makes you a great mom oh you know well, thank you like, i just think it's me just surviving <laughs> <laughs> well you know what ebb and flow us- sounds way cooler <laughs> Well, it's the, it's what I'm hearing in your story. And I think it's a message for most of us to understand that there's a phase for everything, just like with parenting, you're wondering what's wrong. And then the phase passes and you move on. And that's what I think good parents learn to become flexible. And that's what you're doing. You know, you're recognizing what, you know, weighing the good and the bad. Is it better that my husband and I get a minute together? Probably. But then as they get older, you figure it out, you know? So good for you. And, um, and I would love it if you'd like to sort of wrap up our conversation with talking a little bit about your business, because I know how it has really impacted your life during and after and before everything that happened with John and with your foster care and your ability to associate a healthy relationship with food. So if you want to talk a little bit more about Arbonne, I'd love to have you do that at this point. Okay. Yeah. So Arbonne was something I definitely never saw myself doing. I was a special education teacher. I talked to kids that usually aren't paying attention, not grownups that actually sit and look at me. So it's a totally new thing for me. Um, But it ended up being something, one, I keep talking about how it changed my health and my relationship with food um, because we have a great 30-day clean eating program. But we also have a whole bunch of other products. And that's a journey I've been on about just the most pure, safe, and beneficial products that you can that you can find. It's like the best of science and nature. So it's like 
face products that have the cleanest ingredients they could possibly find. They're formulated in the European Union, but they really work. <laughs> like they're not just like a bunch of uh, random ingredients that are safe that aren't tested and don't work. So it's stuff that I already wanted and I was already using. And I was able to, when John was sick, get a promotion and a pay raise. And when I was working all these crazy jobs, I was out of the home. And for me, being away from my kids is just not an option. Um, it allows me to just go out and work closer to bedtime when they're already going to bed soon anyway. I go out a couple of nights a month. And it's starting to replace what my teaching salary was in the past. And it's really looking to really make giant changes for our family. And it's just a really cool opportunity. And a lot of people say that. Um, they're too busy. And I kind of just like, I get it. I hear you. But we're actually looking at taking in a fourth foster child within the next month or so. So, but it's, you can do it. Like it's, it's just a crazy busy ride, but it's fun. Um, it's a great group of people. And yeah, it's great because it's an online link that people can shop from me with. And all I have to do is send it to them or they call me and I'm glad you shared that. I too have, I've been purchasing Arbonne since I was 19 and I, and I'm open to venturing to other brands, but I've always respected and understood their, their, their process, their natural approach, their high quality, everything about that. And, um, and you know, I have just ordered some stuff and I'm so excited because I'm already seeing changes in my face, but yay, thank um, you so I, much. Yeah, of course. And you know, I did see the emotional and social support that came along with, you know, your career during the hardest time in your life. And I did see like how it helped you have healthier options. And now that I understand your personal, you know, struggle and strife with food, I can see how even more impactful that was for you to be able to not dive into this hole in such a hard time because you had such a great support system and some healthy options. So Kudos to them and to you for matching that all up at once. Um, and, and I appreciate you sharing everything. Oh, I mean, literally. Sorry, I was all over the place, but that's kind of how my brain is. I'm a Gemini. I'm just all over the place. I'm here, there, and everywhere. It's, I think with the fostering and the Arbon and the kids, it's just like right now it's one giant crazy mess. <laughs> so, and just regular normal life things. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm all over the place right now. It's, it's perfectly fine. I think most everyone can understand and relate that if they're not all over the place now, they probably were at some point. Yeah. So, um, so thank you so much for joining us. And, um, and yeah, I, I just, I'm so grateful that you shared such personal things and I'm glad you were an open book.